What's up? Welcome in. Hogue and John's with you from Arizona at the owners' meetings. Basically, literally baking in the sun. Very right much now. so. Where's yeah. your uh, tanning lotion? I don't know. I feel like I've lost everything. Use some. It's been quite the morning. Uh, we got an exciting show for you today, though, because Matt Eberflus is sitting down with us here in Arizona. We've kind of made this a tradition at the honors meetings uh, to at least get the head coach, and uh, he was kind enough to do that again. So we're really excited about that. Um, also had breakfast with uh, Flus at the NFC Coaches Breakfast this morning. And, uh, of course, yesterday we heard from Ryan Poles and Kevin Warren. Um, and we're here. We're going to hear from George McCaskey later on today. So we'll get into all those takeaways later on in the show, but I, I'm sure everyone wants to hear right, right away from Matt Eberflus. So we're going to jump right into it, our conversation with the Bears head coach. All right, well, we're excited to once again bring in the head coach of the Chicago Bears, Matt Eberflus, on the Hogan Johns. Thanks for jumping on today. Oh, yeah. I always enjoy it. Appreciate you having me on. Matt, first question, how many push-ups did you do for the annual coaches picture? Zero. I did zero <laughs> push-ups and, and, and uh, yeah, zero. Do you know everybody's kind of talking about that picture? Yeah, my bit. girls keep me informed. You know, <laughs> yeah. they're 23 and 17, so they keep me informed of the stuff that's out there, but uh, pretty funny. Well, I'm going to have to get some workout tips or something because, I mean, it's working. I, got, and I, I can put some <laughs> muscle on these arms. It's yeah. mass. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> they have these things called mesomorphs and ectomorphs, and I'm not sure which one you are, but uh, <laughs> they, yeah. they got, the they skinnier one. The skin- <laughs> <laughs> yeah. um, well, again, thanks for jumping on with us. We, I, I, I've been very fascinated just from like the last couple of weeks of talking, whether it's to you this morning or with Ryan a couple of times as you guys have added players. Just how involved. You, not only you are, but it sounds like your coaching staff. Yeah. And um, it sounds like a lot of that, and, and Ryan talked about this yesterday with us, just your background in recruiting, mm-hmm. like he sees that scouting ability in you and trusts your opinion to that level. That and, and So where does that come from? No, it's just, uh, you know, the years of experience that I had, uh, 18 years in college coaching and, you know, you know, traveling, you know, to high schools and visiting with the high school coaches and then going to – you know, back in the day, they used to have these combines, these regional combines where you'd see these players. And uh, I remember one time when I was in Beaumont, Texas, and they had this regional combine, and I was watching this guy from Jasper, Texas. And and I kept watching him and seeing his movement skills. And um, you know, I went over to the uh, to the coach the next day, and it was Sean Witherspoon. You know, and he's uh, was played for us at Missouri and uh, obviously had a great pro career in Atlanta. Um, and but uh, I saw that skill set there at that pro, at that uh, regional combine that they had back then, and that was at Beaumont High School. But uh, but I love doing that. That's why I enjoy going to the pro days. Uh, that's so enjoyable for me because we get to look at the movement skills of the athlete, uh, be it offensive line, defensive back, receiver, whatever it might be, and uh, getting a chance to do that. And then really visiting with Ryan afterward and, and comparing our notes and what do we see, you know, what do we think about the athlete and. Uh, How's he fit into our vision um, for our football team? Do you have like favorite drills you like to see? You mentioned movement skills. Like, what are you specifically looking for? And I guess how has that changed uh, from from now or to to go back in time to when you were looking at college recruits? Yeah, I mean, obviously, when you have put the guys in position specific drills, um, that's always very important. Um, But you can see the athlete. You know, they've adjusted and changed the ones that the combine, which I think is good. Uh, to some degree, but you can certainly see it uh, in space, you know, with the space players. And then you, know, you see these linemen, the ability for them to have balance. Um, they have flexion in their lowers to be able to uh, maintain that balance when it gets off, when it gets off a little bit. And you can see that during those pro days and, you know, during the combine drills. You mentioned Witherspoon are at the pro level. Are there any guys that you know, you remember as a coach just banging on the table being like, I really like this this, this draft prospect coming out that really worked out for you guys? Um, you know, Shaq Leonard is a guy that we we did a lot of work on with, uh, you know, the guys in Indy, and and uh, it certainly took a, uh, some time for us to get there because, you know, when a guy comes from a smaller school, um, you know, you have to look at different tape, and we certainly looked at the tape when he played Clemson and made a lot of, lot of tackles um, and had a heck of a game, so that certainly showed he could play up at this level. And uh, but we did our work on him, 
and uh, you know he's an outstanding young man, and of course he's a, a fierce competitor, and he's going to have a great comeback here this year. So. What are your favorite like pro day stops? Like, is there a certain town or school you like visiting again? Is it Alabama? Seeing Nick Saban again? Yeah, that was that's very enjoyable for me because of my relationship with Coach Saban. Um, got a chance to speak with him on the field there for about ten minutes, and uh, I certainly enjoy that because I don't get a, a chance to meet with him in person as much as I would like. Uh, but uh, I certainly enjoyed that, our time. And you really, at the pro days, you really just glean one more inch of information uh, if you're talking to the head coach or the defensive coordinator or if you're just really just watching the guy, the way he moves, the way he catches. Um, you just might glean one more inch of information that helps you say yes, helps you say no, and or just table it to, you know, just keep on working on that, on that particular prospect. What do you remember – uh, about playing for Saban, and is there anything like from that experience that really sticks out to you now as you're coaching younger players? Yeah, so uh, you know, I was only with him one year um, as a, as he came in there as his first year as a head coach, and uh, you know, we won the championship, and just the way he set the standards of how we practice, how we are focused in meetings, how we finish plays, and uh, those are the inches that matter in the game of football. You know, it's always a game of inches. Well, those inches are that you, you uh, get those inches in practice in your standardization of the way you uh, finish plays, the way you hustle um, and the way you focus during that. Cause it's all in the preparation, right? So how you prepare is how you're going to play. We have all said that, but that's true. And you got to be mindful of that as a coach. And that's what coach Saban taught me in that short time period with him, just by me observing him and being in that system. So that sounds so familiar to other coaches than as you, that you went on and worked with. I mean, you've talked a lot about Rod Marinelli, your relationship with Lovey Smith. Is that is that just sort of how it works? Like certain coaches sort of philosophically fall in line with coaches that believe the same things? Yeah, no doubt. And I was fortunate, you know, uh, and I said this before that, uh, you know, at Kent State back when Don James was there, there was three coaches on that team when they won the MAC championship. It was Coach Saban. My head uh, high school coach, Pat Gachardo, they were defensive backs, and a tight end on that team was Gary Pinkle, who just got into the Hall of Fame. Yeah. And I had, a, uh, you know, was fortunate to be able to work for or play for all three of those guys. And every what they have, all three of them have the same attribute, and that's attention to detail. And they have an intensity and a focus about them that's unparalleled. So uh, to me, that's what you're always trying to. I, I always had, I've always said this, that I had great examples to go by by watching those guys either through coaching for them or, or playing for them, and uh, I was fortunate that way. Do you have a favorite Nick Saban story, one that you like to share that maybe maybe embodies your memory or, or who he was as a coach? To, to yeah, do? Um, you know, we were at winter conditioning, and we would start dirt, certain drill. You know, we had 16 stations of winter conditioning, and he would go through, and if you didn't run uh, run from one drill to the next when the horn blew, if somebody was jogging or straggling behind, he blew a double horn. That means you had to go back to your original station and blow the horn again and make sure you ran to the next station. So that was always about hustle. It was always about pushing the player past where he couldn't take himself and really working on his mental and physical stamina. And uh, that's what he created in that environment. I'm interested because uh, obviously Saban and Belichick are close. They've you know they've become close over the years. They have they they they've even done some interviews together and some fun shows that right. are like really interesting just to watch them get together with their brilliant football minds. It it definitely caught my attention this season when you guys went into New England and won that game. That Belichick not only things he said during the week leading up to the game because he does that a lot. He talks up to the, a lot the team, but like it really seemed like you guys had a moment at the end of that game that there was a a very obvious level of respect there. Did you feel that way? And what is your relationship like with him um it's it, you know that what i felt after the game was obviously respect and admiration for coach belichick um you know because the all the accomplishments that he's had uh during the course of his career in the example he he sets you know for playing clean sound football and uh, all the championship team teams that he's coached and um, so that was just from my perspective. Uh, and we just really shared at the end, hey, it was a hard-fought game. He really was complimentary of the way we're doing our, our business, the way our team played that night. And, uh, you know, so you can't say enough good things about Coach Belichick. In terms of finding the, those inches where maybe players or prospects start to differentiate themselves, how do you think the putt-putt and the, the darts went with 
with, with players now that you look back on it. Yeah, you know, that's just really a way to put players at ease, you know, ease their mind coming into it, take their mind off of, hey, I got to answer a bunch of questions. I'm going to get grilled during this video session. And it's really for them just to sit back and, hey, this is a fun moment for them. You know, there's only going to be so many times, they, you know, one time they come to the combine, you know, we're only going to interview them that way and one, one time in, the, you know, in that setting. So um, we thought it worked really well. And, you know, the players commented on it. You heard them talk about it. And I thought it's a good strategy. Did they all learn that you're very good at golf as well? <laughs> well, I, because I'm the head coach, I have a, I have a, you know, the way to delegate things. You know? So <laughs> I was not always putting, you know, Ian Cunningham did hit a bomb putt one time. Um, so we have some good golfers on our staff, so it was it was pretty good. A couple of good dart throwers, you know. Uh, Getsy's a heck of a dart thrower. Everybody from Pittsburgh can throw a dart, so <laughs> that's just the way it is. Did, did did the golf games suffer at all being a first-year head coach, and is it recovering at all, or did you still manage no, to keep still, that up? it's still suffering. Uh, you know, it's, <laughs> it was good when I was a linebacker coach, but then when I became a coordinator – it went down a little bit, handicap went up, and then uh, now that I'm a head coach, it keeps going up. So, But that's fine. It's part of the business, and uh, certainly enjoy watching the game, get a chance to play it once in a while, but it's always fun. Do you, do you have any hole-in-ones in your career? I got one hole-in-one. Really? Where was it at? It's a, it's a place I think it's closed. It was in Columbus, Ohio, 1994. It was at Hickory Hills Country Club. It was 194 yards, par three. I hit it left of the pin, 10 feet. And it just went, rolled right into the middle of the cup. And uh, it was a pretty exciting moment. Did you awesome. throw your club? How'd you, how'd you celebrate that one? I, I actually ran to the hole, and I forgot that I was riding a cart. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I, was, I was 24 years old, so I, I was in pretty good shape at the time. So, uh, yeah, so it was fun. What's it like golfing with, with, with Ryan Poles? I imagine he hits bombs, but, like, as a connection between coach and GM. I no, it's good. Kind of, sorry. Yeah, it's really good being able to go and, and play around a round of golf with Ryan. Um, you know, we had our first chance to do it a few weeks back, and uh, – you know, you just, you know, have fun. You know, we're, we're sitting there talking about the game and what would you do here? What would you do there? How you manage the hole and and uh, just spending time out there together. And uh, it was a lot of fun. And, yeah, he can hit a bomb. He's, uh, he's a really good off the tee and can really hit him long. How much have you enjoyed, after all the years you spent on the defensive side of the ball, getting involved in some offensive decisions? Like one thing you mentioned this morning that, that stood out to me was Nate Davis. And it's like, duh, oh, yeah, you, you you went against them twice a year yeah. and you had to scheme against them from that side of the ball. Now you get to bring them over. I mean, how much has that been enjoyable for you? Well, that's really enjoyable. And I think you we uh, take information from everybody when we're looking at a player. And, and you know, oftentimes and many times we, we go to the opposition. You know, what did you think about this defensive player? We'll ask our offensive staff and vice versa with, with the defensive staff because those are the guys that have to go against them. You know, what's special about this player? Is he really a handful? Is he a guy you have to circle? Um, you know, so it, we always do that, and I think that's really important to do. How does that apply to maybe DJ Moore, like when he comes up in those trade conversations? Right. Like how does he tilt the field from your defensive perspective? Yeah, so, you know, when you have – the more weapons you have on offense and the more skill sets you have, uh, it's just harder to defend just in general and then certainly in situational football. You know, it really is hard to defend, and uh, DJ is one of those guys. And I think when you have a guy over there, it's harder to defend, a you know, a Tunyon or, or a Cole or if you have, a, the, the, you know, the receivers all over here and the tight end opposite, that creates a big, big mismatch uh, for the defense. Tanya's another local kid. Yep. Um, and Ryan mentioned this yesterday that he he believes there's something to that. Do you guys share that same philosophy that playing for your hometown team can bring a little bit of extra passion? I, yeah, I you forget can, how exactly put it, but he yeah. seemed, he said there's something to that. You can feel that, you know, with uh, you know Tanya Bobby came in, and then you know TJ came in, and certainly when Sanborn was you know uh, you know we're doing through the draft process last year, you can feel the energy and the love for the Bears um, just because it, from this high. You know, they were, they, you know, they, they were like monsters of the midway and that was a big deal to them. And, uh, you can certainly feel that passion. I think it's a good thing. You know, if they're a good player and they're a homegrown guy and I say, yeah, let's bring them in. If they fit, let's do it. How excited was the, the linebackers coach in you to see Tremaine Edmonds available, to see TJ, TJ Edwards available, but then not to see them be available, but then to go after them successfully sign them like take us through your feelings on that yeah so you you know you go through the process um you know through free agency and we watch all the tape you know and we then we stack them up you know and obviously those guys are at the top of our board and uh it's a rare occasion that you can get the top of your board 
um, you know, in free agency, but we were in position, you know, this year. And I, I talked about it, you know, last night that uh, it's really cool because we had all this money available to us in free agency um, the second year, meaning that, you know, we were able to be with each other for a year, meaning the scouting staff and the coaching staff and really all of our staff of what we want our players to look like, you know, from, you know, mind, body and spirit, you know, what do we want a Chicago Bear to be? And uh, we certainly have a good core group of young guys that we already have on our team that have that spirit. Uh, but uh, to be able to acquire these 11 players, either through trade or through, you know, free agency so far, um, it's been really cool because we're more in line now than we were a year ago at this time. You've, you've mentioned mind, body, spirit before. Which of those three is the hardest to to figure out before a player actually gets into your building? Yeah, I think, uh, well, every person's, you know, different. Which, which we welcome that. You know, we want people to be themselves. We want them to bring their energy that they bring. And it's our job as coaches when we evaluate a player, if we're going to bring them in, to, to get a feel for all three of those aspects. Um, and so I think it's just really about reading the player, talking to them. And when you build a relationship with them, you can kind of feel that over time. And then as a coach, the, the creativity as a coach is to be able to maximize that player's ability through those three avenues to get the product on the field to look the best that it can. And uh, I think you really have to work with the player in all three aspects to be able to get that done. When you look for spirit on tape, like what do you want that to, to look like? You talk about high burn guys, high motor guys. Like yep. it, it sounds simple enough, but like they're not all the same, are they? No. And uh, you got to look at that. So we want to bring a guy that loves football. You know, that's what I, I said that at the combine. And he has passion on the football field. So when you look at that number, you, it shows on tape. He just jumps off the tape and says, man, that guy plays with high energy, plays with high focus. And, you know, then you get into, hey, the functional intelligence of the position, movement skills and all those things. And then you select the player. And uh, I think that's the process we're going through now when we go to our 30 visits. You know, we bring the guys in. We've had a couple of those already. And uh, we really got to dig into the player and, and really gather all the information that we can so we do pick a player that has great mind, body, and spirit. I imagine as a former linebackers coach, you really appreciated what Jack Sanborn brought to your defense last year. Just a lot of those things you were just talking about, showing up on tape, yep. his instincts. What what were those conversations like, though, after you added two other linebackers? And I mean, he could have made an easy case to to you know be your starting Mike again this year, and now he'll probably move back to the Sam. Just what, what were those like? How did he take that? I know he's excited to play with TJ again, but yeah. Yeah, he's he, he's well. He's a pro. He's a pro's pro, and uh, he's he's going to work and, and do his thing. He understands that you know he's going to have playing time, you know, in our defense for sure, because because he does have quickness, instincts, and strike, and uh, he's phenomenal that way. And uh, we just really added value to our football team, and that's what our job is. You know, Ryan and myself is to add value to the team, and that's about acquiring more talent. Uh, the more talent we have on on the uh, on the field, um, and the more we play to our standard. Uh, doing it the Bears way, uh, good things are going to happen. You mentioned those those top thirty visits. How do you how do you run them? Like, take us inside. Like, what are some of your go to questions? I, I imagine that differs by player, but how is take us through your process for those right. interviews? Yeah, so you know, they, obviously they meet with various people in our building. That's important to meet with the coordinator, position coach, and go through the X and O's. We teach them things, and they got to teach them back to us. And I think that's important to really discern what their where their FBI is. Um, where their baseline is and where we can take them to um, in terms of that uh, functional intelligence. And then really it's getting to know the person, you know, getting to know him. Has he got great team ability? Does he fit him with his teammates? Um, you know, and then what's going to be his role, you know, going forward into our football team. Um, and then, you know, you do some fun things with them. You quiz them on certain things about the Bears and the Bears history and see if he can remember those types of things. But uh, and we have a fun way of doing that. But uh, um, You're not going to reveal it? Do you have the quiz on No, you? because I'd be giving the answers <laughs> away to the guys. Oh, yeah. If we only had two or three of them, there'd be, what, 27 guys came in that would know the answers <laughs> to the test. So we They're all definitely sure. listening to this. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> a couple of local kids who yeah. might get oh, drafted. Yeah. Yeah. Or, or their dads are listening or something like that. Um, you know, I... Where, I guess, you, you've talked, you and Ryan's talked about loosening them up and the putt-putt and all that, but, like, that can't be easy to actually loosen them up because this is a really long job interview. It seems like there's more success with that maybe when they actually come into the facility, but, right. um, like, is 
and and how much does that matter? Like if a guy is still uptight, does that is that is that still something that you don't like to see? You want to see them uh, well, loosen I mean, up a little bit? Yeah, I think loosen up. Uh, you know, some guys are just wired with a with an intensity and focus. Um, I remember I had uh, Sean Lee, you know, from Penn State when I was doing when I was back with Dallas. He was so intense and so focused. That's just who he is. You know, it's it's not to say that he wasn't relaxed because he was. He's very confident in his ability, and he's uber smart. You know, he's one of the smartest players I've ever coached. But um, you know, he was just that way, and that's his put together. You know, that's what I'm talking about. You got to be able to evaluate the man. You know how he was put together, and you know his upbringing is a big part of that. But just you know how he's wired, and that's okay. You know, you know you welcome that. Like I said, we want all all players to be themselves, and. A good player looks and acts uh, differently. You know, there's, it comes in all shapes and sizes, and you have to be able to evaluate that as, an, as, a, uh, as a pro staff, you know, coaching staff, and a scouting department. If you want to, to get some analysis or, or some information on their podcasting skills, we could come to Hallis Hall. <laughs> you know, I think it's, we're, the, we're the only Bears podcast with coaching experience yeah. <laughs> at some level. So we, at least a we, little bit. We, 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 we can make that a stop in the 30 visit for sure. There yeah. we go. There yeah. we go. You only get five minutes, so. <laughs> Yeah, fair <laughs> bang, enough. Bang, bang. I, I I'm trying to figure out who's who's who would want to wear the number zero. Like I'm picturing like a fullback, like can Kari Blasting game wear wear number zero? I, I don't it's gonna look weird no matter who's doing it, but I'm just trying to picture in my head who on the Bears it would where it would actually look kind of cool. We'll see. Any ideas? Yep. yep. Time will tell. I'm not, I'm not sure who's uh who's wanting that, but we'll see. It's Kicker definitely way. not a linebacker number. <laughs> No. Well, no, and apparently the offensive lineman and defensive lineman can't wear it, right? right? Did I read that right? Yeah, so it'll be interesting. Coach, we appreciate your time. I know it's been a busy day with all the meetings and stuff, uh, but it was fun talking to you this morning, too, and we always, I know our listeners definitely appreciate uh, you jumping on the podcast. Yep. Thanks, so for thanks for having so much me on, guys. I appreciate it. All right. Thanks, man. Do your financial goals feel out of reach? They don't have to be. With Chimes, Secured Credit Builder Visa Credit Card, you can start building credit with your own money through on-time payments and small everyday purchases like groceries, streaming, and gas. Members see an increase of 30 points to their credit scores on average. Chime reports your payments to the major credit bureaus to help you build credit over time, all with no annual fees, large security deposits, or credit checks to apply. Start making your financial dreams a reality with Chime. Sign up only takes two minutes and doesn't affect your credit score. Get started at Chime.com slash Adams. That's Chime.com slash Adams. The Chime Credit Builder Visa Credit Card, pursuant to a license from VCUSA, Chime Checking Account, and $200 qualifying direct deposit required to apply for the secured Chime Credit Builder Visa Credit Card. Based on a study conducted by Experian, Credit Builder members observed an average 30-point FICO score, 8 increase after 8 months. With regular on-time payments, results may vary. See Chime.com for details. Out-of-network ATM withdrawal fees may apply. Accept at MoneyPass ATMs in a 7-Eleven or any AllPoint or Visa Plus Alliance ATM. All right, well, we greatly appreciate Flew sitting down with us. Biggest takeaways? His influence is kind of paramount yeah. at, at this point. I don't want to overstate it, but it's it's there. It's there in the evaluations. It's there in the free agency signings. He's getting what he wants, and Ryan Poles is is all bored uh, for this right now. Yeah, and that's I think that's the key thing. They're you, together, I should yeah, say. Yeah, you hear Ryan. I mean, Ryan's really the one who started – started talking this up himself and his recent interviews, including yesterday when we talked to him. And um, that's why I really wanted to dive in with him a little bit in some of where that comes from, because Ryan mentioned Fluce's recruiting days in college and just all that background information that they have to gather when they're going through all that. A lot of it translates to the NFL, especially because they actually look at you know how a, they Paul said that yesterday. They look at how a player handled their rec, their recruiting yes, days when yeah. they were in high all school, all the way back to high school. Yeah. yeah, and not all coaches have this experience. Mark, I don't think Mark Tressman did. I don't think I know Matt Nagy didn't because all his coaching was at a, a, a pro level. Yeah. So to have this be part of your draft evaluations, I think it carries serious weight. It's significant in terms of finding those inches that Matt Eberflus talked about, separating the the good prospects from maybe the great ones or the, the average ones when they all look the, the same in terms of a physical profile, if they all have the same 40 time or in the same range of certain measurables. And Flu said in his breakfast this morning that, the, I mean, the coaching day right now with his coaches being at Alice Hall, they're working on football in the morning and scouting in the afternoon. Yeah. So they're, I mean, they're really involving everyone in this process and, and, Taking in all their backgrounds uh, and experiences. I, I like how you noticed, because I picked up on this too, the mind, body, and spirit 
as part of their evaluation. I, I know the Bears are big on their buzzwords and you know they have their acronyms and whatnot, but those are such important like staples of, of an organization just in terms of having everybody on the same page of what you're looking for. Simple words like that. It keeps everybody on the same page. It helps evaluations, helps enhance them, especially when you have prospects grouped together. Yeah, absolutely. Um, well, I hope everyone enjoyed that, that part of the conversation. Uh, we haven't had a chance yet to get together and talk about the things that were discussed yesterday, too. I mean, what stood out to you about what Ryan Poles and Kevin Warren had to say? Well, I want to go back to maybe the David Montgomery conversation because yeah. it seems like the, the Bears thought they had a very competitive offer in terms of keeping David Montgomery, and then he, he decides to sign. <laughs> it doesn't just leave him free agency. He joins the Detroit Lions, yeah. and even – when we asked Ryan Poles about that, he kind of careful. There's someone right there. Lions right here, lion walk, walk, walking by. Um, he chuckled at that because he knows. All of a sudden, Dan Campbell comes from out of nowhere. <laughs> yes, sit down right here. We're the, we're the, giant, we're the giant Starbucks. Jane just throws it at two, you. Two of them. Uh, join Hogan Johns. Come aboard. Um, but yes, David Montgomery is going to run so physically violent against the Bears in those two matchups. Like you could just hear the collisions right now. But Ryan Poles. Just talking to him. He, he knows it's coming. It's like, yeah. the Bears got to be prepared for that. Yeah, that's interesting. I mean, because, I mean, if he left on his, I guess he'll still have that chip on his shoulder anyway, but it's yeah. not like the Bears didn't want him. Right. And then he signed with Detroit. That Then I could see him really running angry. But that's just his style to begin with. That's why they liked him. That's why I was kind of surprised to see him go. I thought that with the running back market the way it was, that they would have found some type of an, an agreement. But as polls put it, you know, the player has a choice, choice too. Yeah. And, yeah. And, and, and sometimes they want to go. And somewhere now else. we have another revenge game narrative. Um, yes. the two. Other, two, two, yeah. yes, two. Another thing that stood out to me from the Ryan polls conversation is that how he knows there's a hole at right tackle. He knows the offensive line needs help, but at this point in free agency, it is what it is. The salaries aren't the same. The players aren't the same. The talent level, to use his words, just just isn't the same. Maybe some things work out after the draft, but at this point, it's full full steam ahead to the draft to find that that tackle for the offense. Well, and I think that's going to be one of the most fascinating parts of the draft this year is he, they really have been patient, and they're they've come out and said like. Who cares if we have linebackers already? If that's the best guy we can get, the right position. And Flush just talked about it with us here. You know, they're they're just they're here to get good football players. Yeah, and, and that's the bottom line, regardless of what position they necessarily play. Now they certainly have their di- giant depth chart up on the boards at all given moment, and they realize where the holes are. But I just wonder. You, you bring up that need at, at right tackle, you know. I think it's just a need in general at tackle. Well, I guess what I'm getting at is it, I'm not changing my philosophy at all in my head analyzing the draft. I'm not saying like, oh, well, they definitely need a right tackle. That's who they're targeting in the first round. No. Because no. I don't get that sense. That's not how they've operated, and I don't anticipate on that changing. So what you're saying, if Paris Johnson Jr. is the best left tackle, he's drafted at number nine, and he's better than Braxton Jones, then Braxton yeah. Jones, you have to move the right tackle. Yeah. And, and Matthew Flus. Not in our conversation earlier on this podcast, but at breakfast, yeah. though nobody was eating, at the, the circle table we were all <laughs> sitting at, um, suggested as much. that That's a, a possibility. Yeah. Like, he's not just cemented in at the left side. I don't I don't get the sense that they want to do that. I just get the sense that their philosophy is, we're just going to add the best players and then figure it out from there. Yeah, it, we're not going to pass on a player because we already have somebody playing that position. And I just think that's a really smart way about going about building a football You, you just saw that play out with right guard. Yeah, you add Nate Davis, even though you feel good about what Tevin Jenkins gave to you, you still have some questions about durability. But you know what? One of the best guards available. You need help in the trenches, especially from the inside-outside protection. Now you can move Tevin Jenkins to the left side. Yeah, we'll continue to do you know shows from here and there where they fit on the stadium and as that as that comes together. But with Kevin Warren, I mean that was a lot of the conversation yeah. yesterday. Understandably so. Not, I, I didn't really think there was anything you know new to the table. The, the reality is he, he's been doing a lot of background information, having these regular meetings, but he hasn't really implemented any change no. or had any you know significant say over anything. That's all going to start April 17th, and it, I imagine just get, understanding his demeanor, he's going to hit the ground running right away. But at this point, the only thing that's changed since January is they closed on the land 
I, I thought one interesting nugget he did say yesterday is typically once you put a shovel in the ground, it'll take 36 months. Because everybody wants a timeline. Yeah, yeah. It'll take 36 months. But the question is, he has no idea right now when that shovel goes in the ground no, because no. there's so much political stuff to figure out. That being said, the money, the taxes. It's th- there is one significant thing. The messaging could have legally changed since they closed on the land. Before they weren't allowed to even talk about a different place. And he made it very clear yesterday, even though the land's been closed and they could entertain something else now from a legal standpoint, it's still about Arlington. Yeah, it's still Arlington, but you're right. right. He may hit the ground running come April, but that ground isn't being (laughs) broke. He's not running in the ground in Arlington. There's going to be a racetrack there for a little bit. Yes, yes. Dick because it's not going anywhere (laughs) for, for the time being. So anything else? Before we wrap up here? No, you can tell he's excited. Matty Bufloos is excited about his two linebackers. I think they came through at breakfast this morning in our conversations here. Uh, I think they have uh, a, a player in the Marcus Walker who could do different things. But, yes, a general sense of excitement in terms of what they've added. Like players they think they could fit not only like on the field, but that intangible sense yes. that they're looking for as well. Yeah, and you heard Flus talk on about that with us. I mean, it really is about the fit and they, they, they don't, they don't seem like the type of guys that are just going to say, you know, at the 11th hour with some random free agent who's on the table, oh, let's just bump it up and let's get this done. Yeah, no, no. They're not taking yeah. those risks. Maybe that'll change over time as they get, you know, close and closer to having a winner, but um, it's still that long-term view right now. Yeah, they had some lines they were not going to cross in free agency and then just like the general mood of 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 the team here in phoenix with everybody here for a team that had three wins they're really like i I know kevin warren used the word like calm or ryan poles used the word calm there seems to be a sense of call it satisfaction or confidence in where things are headed especially after trading the first overall pick yeah confidence is a good word i think both the gm and the head coach give that off Yes. quite clearly and um, we'll see if the results follow We've got a lot of a lot of time before that we see we see get to see football again yeah. but uh, although not too long OTAs will be here in next month a little bit two months well May. right after the draft will be the, the rookie rook, mini camp rookie mini camp will start we'll see players out there so it'll be fun and we'll of course have you covered make sure you're checking out all of uh, the coverage from here too as well theathletic.com slash Hogan Johns all chgo.com as well um, and we'll have plenty more. I'm actually technically off the rest of the week. I'm staying down here a couple extra days, but Kevin's going to be with you, I think, on Thursday for another episode. Yes. And uh, so they'll have a lot more coming up on Thursday. And then we are, not that it isn't already draft season, but we're going not dive, now it's diving now. into the draft season as soon as we're done with the owners. <laughs> yes, meeting. a lot of good guests coming up. Absolutely. So uh, make sure you're following us on Twitter as well, and the merch is all up at obviousshirts.com. Appreciate everybody watching us here from Phoenix and um, these guys will give you a little bit more on Thursday. See ya. Hey, what's up, Flues? 